COVID-19, the deadly virus which is spread to every continent on the globe. What's it like to actually have the coronavirus and undergo treatment for it? Just 63 days, that's how long it's taken 17,704 people across the African continent to get infected with coronavirus. It's via Zoom, is a virologist at case. Ghana reports 5,408 COVID-19 cases. We've had to cut down on the numbers. We need to cut down even on production. Now I'm afraid you're just the clarification we buy. About a third of the revenues are not coming in. For one month, the paper was off the stance. The lives of thousands have been snuffed out as the ripples of an unprecedented pandemic, the COVID-19, the scale of which has never been witnessed before, reverberated across the globe, bringing robust economies to their knees and putting almost every sector, including the media, in distress. Now more than ever, the need for information has become pronounced but how will Ghana's news media navigate these uncharted waters to live up to their mandate as they reel under the impact of this pandemic? This pandemic presents an opportunity for new and creative ways of gathering, reporting, and producing the news and a chance for journalism to reinvent itself. I am Araba Kumsen and in this edition of Hotline, I speak to journalists and media managers about the effects of COVID-19 on their operations and what measures they are taking to survive in these turbulent times. Hello Ghanaians, good evening. The Minister of Health has confirmed two cases of COVID-19. Health Minister Kwekwajiman Menu announcing the first two confirmed cases of COVID-19 on March 12th in a late night broadcast on Joy News. The news confirmed the long-held fears of many that the virus, which had ravaged thousands in the Chinese town of Wuhan and across some European countries, would eventually find its way into the country. It wasn't a question of if, it was a matter of when. And with the threat of the virus spreading, it quickly became evident that it would no longer be business as usual for the process of gathering information for news purposes. Definitely how we do our coverage, that has definitely changed. Um, how we even prepare for outside coverage is completely changed. Now we have to be more careful. We have PPEs which we have procured and we, we even procured it, I think in the first, uh, before the lockdown. We had PPEs for everybody to go out, full shield, face shield for every reporter. We have longer microphones so that we can observe social distancing. So we've really prepared. What are we doing wrong that we appear to be seeing increased number of cases? Gladys Arthur, popularly known as Ifia Pokwa, is head of programs at UTV and an anchor there too. She says it was a decision management had no difficulty taking to ensure that reporters are protected as they go out every day searching for stories at the risk of contracting the disease. And that runs across for many of the media houses in the country, including City FM and City TV, where Bernard Avle is general manager. Pre-lockdown, during lockdown, post-lockdown, we've amended the strategy. Mm -hmm. But 
whatever it is, when you go out, you have to have your masks. You have to sanitize, as I always do. Some of them even wear gloves to the chagrin of some of our viewers and that type of thing. Mm. And then, of course, because it's also a question of contact, mm. you've had to cut down the numbers, not even financially, mm. because if you have a newsroom of 55 people right. in a small space, right. that doesn't work. Right. So we've had to create groups. We've created a core team mm -hmm. who are sort of the backbone of the newsroom. And then you have the people who come in in terms of shifts. Right. So you limit the number of interactions. The need to adhere to the social distancing protocols has become extremely necessary, especially after it emerged that workplaces had been identified as hotspots of the disease. But Acting General Manager of GH1 TV, Nanaba Anamwa, tells me the safety of their staff was paramount from the onset, as she explains why they were compelled to cut down the numbers. We don't want to expose people, mm -hmm. uh, so we reduce the numbers. Uh, ordinarily, on a normal day, we would have about 15 people in the newsroom, for instance. Now we have five. Mm -hmm. Five people doing the work of, you know, the other 10 right. and that's very difficult um, and so they go out and we still have to fill an hour of news mm -hmm. and so they have to double up and sometimes you feel it affects the treatment just a wee bit you mm. know because you know that if you had more numbers like 10 other people right. then people would have time to work on their stories mm -hmm. properly so really how has the pandemic transformed the practice of journalism? Well, for one thing, more people are working from home now, a departure from the practice of assembling in a physical newsroom to do the story or broadcast the news. The coronavirus pandemic has turned everything upside down. Working from home has now become the new normal. But what if working from home included lights, camera and action? Well, that's the case for my colleague and fellow editor Israel Lai, who's been broadcasting the news from his home right here for the past few weeks. So let's go inside and see how it all goes down. We started, made a few attempts, we tried um, a few setups and we decided that yes, we could do it. What does it entail? I mean, do you have all the TV sets? Do you have lighting sets? What, what did it entail to put all that together to give our viewers what they're seeing? So shortly, I'm going to take you in there so you get to see. But we have lights, we have camera and we have action. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we, so we tried a number of things. Okay. We, we tried one setup. We improvised a lot. I mean, as I indicated, we don't have the technology that the yeah. Fox News and the CNNs exactly. and the BBC right. would have. Mm -hmm. But yes, we had to make do with what was available. And I think we've done a, quite a bit of improvisation and uh, it, it's worked for us. Okay. In the studio, you're used to doing things a certain way. Here at home, you don't have all the equipment that you have back in the studio. Mm -hmm. The talk back mm. and, uh, and the studio feel. Mm. You're used to, you're, you've worked in that environment for a long time. Right. And then now it turns out that things have changed. In addition, mm. I'm having to do a lot of the things that the sound man would do, uh -huh. the broadcast technician <laughs> would do, the lighting man would right. do, and uh, the cameraman. I mean, essentially, uh -huh. I'm do having to do quite a bit more, in fact, a whole lot more. Mm than I typically would be doing in the office. It's a hands-on deck uh, situation here. And very soon, Israel is going to be taking me inside to see how it all goes down. But as he explained, this is an incredible experience. So Israel, let's see how it all goes All right, down. let's go then. This, uh, this may be a bit difficult coming um, question that I have to put to you. Clearly, technology has played a crucial role in enabling news personnel to work from home whether from behind the camera, like Israel Lae, or behind the computer screen, as many resort to the video conferencing apps, Zoom and Cisco WebEx, to share ideas with colleagues or interact with panelists. If I can bring four guests 
from all over the world via Zoom for my TV show. Mm -hmm. Why on earth do they need to drive and come at 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. post-COVID? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. It's a very great innovation, mm -hmm. uh, the Zoom. Because, you know, sometimes you invite people over to your studio and they've come all the way, mm -hmm. you're interviewing them, and you want that interview to be as crisp as possible. Mm -hmm. Two, three minutes maximum mm -hmm. but because the person has come all the way you have a reader a presenter on air who feels okay let me go on and do another 10 15 minutes mm -hmm. and the rest of it is all trash really <laughs> we have maximum two guests in the studio normally we have one-on-one -on -one interviews but maximum we have two guests in the studio the rest of the interviews are all done on skype zoom or telephone the harsh impact of the coronavirus pandemic has been felt across board and nowhere is it more felt than in the newspaper industry which has already been struggling with the onset of the coronavirus pandemic their woes have worsened i'm here today to speak to managing editor of the daily dispatch ben efson on how the pandemic has affected their business and how they are adopting innovative ways to stay alive The dispatch has been around for over 22 years. And COVID was the first time that for one month, the paper was off the stands because the vendors were just not, one, people were not going to work because the vendors sell by the whole side. So for one month, uh, there was no newspaper on the stand. Because so of the, the lockdown? There was a lockdown. Executive editor of the Daily Guide newspaper, Fortune Alimi, has lived this experience too. As a manager of one of the country's popular newspapers, he has had to take some tough decisions after patronage of their paper dropped significantly following the announcement of the lockdown. We took the decision not to come out at all. But after coming out, we need to also take a lot of measures in order to stay afloat, as I said. We need to cut cost. We need to cut down even on production. We need to cut down on the hours of production so that we save production costs, electricity, transportation, fueling. We need to cut down on a lot of uh, these things. Let's talk about the impact it's had on the business. You mentioned that people were not patronizing the newspapers, especially during the lockdown. Why is that? Why is that? Because people were not out. Two, the vendors were not even there. Even if they were there, they were not ready to also sacrifice their lives because they are also dealing with the public, the handling of money. You realize that one of the means of transmitting, transmission of the, uh, this disease is handling of money. You see trader, hearing traders also contracting the disease. Where did they get it from? Through money. Underpinning these challenges the media houses face is the economic impact the pandemic is having on their operations. Cost of newsprint is gone up. Paint, inks, because you use ink, you use ink, especially plates and uh, newsprint. We buy the real, the big one. So everything is gone up. Transportation, because you need to transport it from the merchandise to the office. So everything is gone up. But as I told you, we have to look at our budget and see where you can cut in order to support the business, for the business to thrive. Across the board, many media organizations have been compelled by the prevailing circumstances to take some measures to remain not just relevant, but competitive. But that has come at a cost, as Bernard Avle tells me. Immediately the lockdown was announced, mm -hmm. we decided that we had to limit the number of people who had to move okay. because we didn't know how throttles were going to work. Okay. So staff who could move closer to the office were encouraged to do so. Right. Then we decided that every staff would be picked from home for the three weeks of the lockdown. Right. Nobody would take public transport, right. not even Uber okay. for three weeks. Okay. Nobody would buy food from outside. So the company provided breakfast and lunch oh, wow. for three weeks for everybody. Wow. Because we, we didn't understand the disease very well and we didn't know 
how the security would implement the lockdown. Mm. So, and because news can't wait, mm -hmm. we didn't want to give our people additional problems. Yeah. Chief Operating Officer of the Multimedia Group Limited, Ken Ansa, says the pandemic meant the company had to put in place critical safety measures to protect staff. In a media operation, your biggest asset is your people. At this point, you have to go out there and gather content. You still have to um, use vehicles. When you are picking people from home, bringing them to the office and back, you have to ex uh, observe so, uh, social distancing rules, which means that a car that could take three people, four people, should not take two people. That adds to the cost, you know. So <coughs> you have to now look at who you really need in times like this. Yes, you need everyone, but who do you really need to serve your audience? Who are the people that um, have to really be here to give you what you want. Revenue generation is being negatively affected. Of course, with the reliance on technology now, as media organizations gravitate more towards the use of Zoom and Skype, the cost of data has become a factor to consider in planning during this time. But the most far-reaching impact the pandemic has had on the industry has been the drop in revenues. The media space thrives a lot on activations. Mm. So maybe three, four times in a week, you have an ad agency calling, oh, this brand is launching this. And you, you know, we have a special, um, you know, a, a, a fee mm -hmm. for what we call paid for stories, oh. the business stories. Right. Right. And now they're not coming mm. and consistently, Every week you have those stories, three, four of them, every day in, in a bulletin. Right. Now you don't have that at all because the activation industry is all gone. Right. In this business, revenue comes from sponsorships, right. adverts, and then events. Mm. Events are down. Mm -hmm. So about a third of the revenues are not coming in. Mm -hmm. A lot of the uh, businesses which had like long-term contracts, some of them will say, you know what, we're going to stop the sponsorship and just play spot ads. Okay. So some of the revenues have been affected yes it's been tougher Absolutely. it's been tougher because um, now most companies who had put in X amount for advertising would not advertise and because of the cost quite a number of the newspapers have moved from two cities 50 pesos to three cities you mean your cost of production? The cost of production has gone up. Dial star 170 hash for MTN Momo. And advertising revenues continue to decline. As some companies cut back on their advertising spending on the media, others have completely withdrawn. Although the statistics are not readily available, experts estimate money's being lost could be in the millions of CDs. But why are we here? Senior lecturer at the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Ghana, Dr. Abena Enimwa Yebua Benin, offers some insight. If you look at it, the way in which media organizations raise a lot of their monies is by selling the eyes and ears of audience members to advertisers or companies that have something to advertise about. If those companies anything happens that limits their ability to pay for advertising, media organizations are going to suffer. And with dwindling revenues comes the inevitable but painful decision to lay off staff and put a freeze on hiring new employees. But not all organizations are prepared to let their staff go. Some have directed employees to go on extended leaves, whilst others, although relatively smaller, say laying off staff was not an option given the prevailing circumstances. It's not an agenda because we're also trying to put in place one or two things in order to make sure that nobody suffers. But for now, we have not considered that. 
Nonetheless, media experts such as Dean of the University of Ghana School of Information and Communication Studies, Professor Audrey Gajapo, believe government must prioritize the media in its bid to support all enterprises that have been distressed by COVID. Of course, that's only fair because government is trying to support all enterprises that have been distressed by COVID and the media business is one of them. So the media is a business and like many businesses, there's been a COVID impact on them. And so yes, government has an obligation to, to do that. It's for them to make their case. Um, I, I often joke that the, the media can defend the underdog, but sometimes they're not very good at defending themselves. The Daily Guide's Fortune Alimi agrees. I also think that the media, we need to come together. It has to be a collective decision by all the media groups. Even this stimulus package we are talking about, we don't know when it's coming. When are they going to disperse? Do you fold your arms and wait for them? Although the idea of government financially supporting media organizations is generally accepted by all in the industry, opinions are divided on the manner in which the support ought to be given. What is critical that we need to call? Ken Ansa of the Multimedia Group believes any form of support is welcome. Everyone in, in the nature of their business, and so people could uh, uh, subscribe to various ways they believe um, government can support. If uh, giving tax breaks achieve that better, that is fine. But City's Bernard Avle doesn't think a capital injection is what media houses require at this time. He explains why. I actually think that the best thing to do is to support the media houses mm -hmm. to keep people in employment. Mm -hmm. So my, my point was, instead of media asking for a bailout, mm -hmm. as in give us one million to share, right. tell multimedia, multimedia, I'm going to give you a six month reprieve on your, um, we call them your statutories, mm -hmm. your PAYE, your VAT and all these things. Mm -hmm. Just guarantee that you will keep all your staff in a job. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. Because what unemployment does to an economy is worse than what not paying taxes does. Right. So if Joy FM can say, instead of sucking five people, we'll keep all the five in a job. We may pay them half salary, mm -hmm. but after three months they'll have a job. Mm -hmm. They won't go into depression. Mm -hmm. They will not become social deviants. I completely agree that governments must look into the tax rebate for, mm. for the media because I, I don't know how we're going to survive in another two, three months. I honestly don't know. But what can media managers do in the interim as they await assistance from government to show up their dwindling revenues? Dr. Abna Enimwa Yebua Benin suggests traditional media organizations must gravitate towards the digital media space. So if you're a media manager, I'd imagine that one of the things you really need to look at um, immediately is what you're doing with your digital presence, your digital platforms. How can you augment it so that you get a lot more people following you on those platforms and then you can then sell those people's eyes and ears um, to advertisers. And already some, particularly those in the newspaper industry, such as the Daily Dispatch, are taking advantage of the opportunities that exist within the digital space. The Daily Dispatch had had We've started a subscription service because we realized that um, if we have to maybe take your car 200 meters to go and buy a copy of dispatch and you don't get, you've wasted your time, you've wasted your fuel if every time. So we've had a subscription service that people subscribe and by every morning 6.30 um, you have that dispatch on your phone. COVID has certainly changed the world of work across the globe for many organizations, including the media industry. And although this is a global pandemic, its impact is local. How will this pandemic change the business of news going forward?
There is one side of the pandemic which is having pushed us to try things that we hadn't done before. For instance, um, casting news from home, you know, without having to be here. Um, people working from home, um, the online team being able to work from home and still cover online story and do stories. They are editors editing them, being posted without you knowing where they even sit. So yes, it has opened our eyes to new ways of doing, doing things. I think it's an eye-opener. Mm -hmm. um, it's come with a huge cost to businesses, but it's also opened our eyes to so many things. Exactly. Things that hitherto we could have done to save yes. um, you know, a lot of money for mm -hmm. the business. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been an eye-opener. And I think going forward, I will want more people to spend more time at home as long as they're delivering. <laughs> and fortunately, fortunately, mm -hmm. uh, my team has been delivering. Those at home are delivering every day. When you have to be home for three weeks, mm -hmm. your sample has been taken, results are not coming back, police are beating you and you don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. You realize that journalists are important mm -hmm. and you actually look forward to tuning into a TV or radio show. Mm -hmm. So I think even though financially it's taken a toll on all of us, mm -hmm. I think you and I have to admit that Look, people even brought us donations of PPEs, mm. right? Mm. They brought, people could see the work we were doing. Yes. When they see you out there with your mask, exactly. you've left your family, mm -hmm. and you are in a market, mm -hmm. which is not observing social distance, and you are trying to get the story from them. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, somebody wrote on Facebook that now we now know the essential workers in Ghana is the media, mm -hmm. the nurses, and the doctors. Mm -hmm. Because no matter what the government does, if we don't tell the story, nothing changes. Exactly. And the policies and the um, strategies the government implements depend on the behavior of the citizens. And without media, you can't achieve that. COVID-19 has introduced an interesting paradox. Never in the history of humanity has the need for news and information been so important and never before has the news media faced such a crunch which painfully inhibits the performance of this fundamental necessity of journalism. So far, the ingenuity of industry has shown that stories would also meet deadlines, no matter the challenges. For Hotline, I am Arba Kumsund.